59 at 10. 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Space shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. I still can't believe that I'm going to actually be going into that shuttle. It just, it, it just really doesn't seem possible. Maybe when I'm on the launch pad it will. What are you most excited about? Seeing the Earth from that perspective of, of that small planet, you know, it, it's such a big place here, but being able to look at it from a new perspective, and I hope I can bring that wonder and that excitement back to the students. Liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. We're awaiting word. They're holding their breath just, I'm sure, as everyone else is. In the center of the fire and the smoke, you can't see anything. This is raw, unedited video, just sent via satellite. picture you were just seeing is Christy McCullough's parents watching in horror. These are the students from her school. Many of them probably had their view blocked just as we did with the television cameras with just a huge fireball and a huge cloud of smoke. They may not realize yet what has happened. You see concern etched on their faces. The breath that they've been holding released. And then the realization sets in that something is wrong. card for abort modes. Flight GC, negative downlink. Copy.
Flight Fido. Go ahead. RSO reports vehicle exploded. Copy. Fido, can we get any reports from recovery forces? Stand by. Fido flight. Go ahead. Did the RSOs have an impact point? Stand by. Everybody, stay off the telephones. Make sure you maintain all your data. Start pulling it together. Fido flight. Go ahead, sir. Are the LSOs on the loop? We can get them. Get them up on this loop, please. Yes, sir. It's the LSO. Okay. Are there any forces headed out that way? Yes, sir. DOD LSO reports that all, all soft forces have been scrambled in the R. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. The Challenger 7 were aware of the dangers, but overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye. All the communications between the shuttle and mission control indicated everything was going fine. There was a sense of relief that the much-delayed flight was finally underway. It happened just over one minute into flight. A chilling report. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Slow motion. A search effort couldn't begin for some 15 minutes after this. Debris, they said, just kept raining from the sky. The head of the space shuttle program had no explanations, just sorrow at the tragedy. At 11.40 a.m. this morning, Space program experienced a national tragedy with the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger approximately a minute and a half after launch from here at the Kennedy Space Center. Computer enhanced video shows the explosion in detail. One explosion appears to happen at the rear of the spacecraft around the main engines, perhaps in one of the two solid rocket boosters. Then a blast higher up. The shuttle was instantly a blazing fireball. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it is cleared to tower. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Looking back at the records, it possibly was the coldest day of the winter that year. Temperatures had dipped into the 20s, and at launch, I think we were in the mid-30s. That was about 15 degrees colder than any launch up to that point in time. This doesn't play well with some of the engineering that is involved in a space shuttle. A cold and crisp morning with clear blue skies. January 28, 1986. The crew of Space Shuttle Challenger prepared to make history. In the uh, foreground now, preparing uh, to put on their egress harnesses is uh, Greg Jarvis and Krista McAuliffe. Krista McAuliffe was selected out of 11,000 teacher applicants. With the entire country watching, Concord's Krista McAuliffe was on the verge of becoming the first teacher in space. The uh, teacher observer, uh, Krista McAuliffe, has been handed an apple by the uh, closeout crew. But seconds later, Challenger fell back to Earth. Its crew lost forever, but their spirit is never forgotten. To follow your instincts and go for your dreams, and uh, you know, I hope, hope they achieve that. 
She was a true pioneer on the last frontier, blessed with a rare fusion of courage, character, and charm. Krista McAuliffe was a natural. She was a leader while comfortably wearing the mantle of wife and mother. She was smart, yet disarming with her simple, anything is possible attitude. As a girl, Krista marveled at the early days of the space program. As a woman, she yearned to be part of it. In 1985, Krista was a teacher at Concord High School, where she instructed courses in economics, law, and American history. It was President Ronald Reagan who pitched the idea to put a teacher in space, in part to generate interest in NASA and to increase the profile of the space shuttle program. After extensive interviews, these 10 teachers will now vie for the one spot designated by President Reagan to put an educator in space. Krista McAuliffe was one of 11,000 applicants from across the country, but became a finalist for the Teacher in Space program. I, I couldn't believe it. In fact, it wasn't until the next morning I, w I was still kind of pinching myself, trying to make sure that I, I was one of the 10. <laughs> Krista McAuliffe will fly to Houston Monday to begin extensive testing of her physical and psychological makeup. Tonight, it was off to her home in Concord. Come January, it may be off to the stars. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McAuliffe. She had earned the right to voyage toward the stars with the crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger. I always ask my students, you know, to go and seek whatever they feel they can do and reach a little higher. In her training, Krista charged forward with her trademark enthusiasm and humor. Lunch is served. <laughs> Her part of the mission was to teach a class from space through closed-circuit TV to more than one million students across the country. To the nation, she was the astronaut teacher, but to her local high school, she was a teacher turned hero. And to New Hampshire, she was a proud representative of the state's rugged spirit. This is a News 9 special report, the launch of the Challenger. Lauren Baker has been in Florida since late Wednesday. She has been watching all the developments of Krista McAuliffe and her space shuttle crew. It's a terrific day down here. I've got to tell you, the skies are blue, the winds are light. It is very, very chilly, though. It's only about 30 degrees right now. The mission had to be scrubbed twice because of weather and mechanical issues. But on Tuesday, January 28, 1986, the clock slowly ticked toward liftoff. Concord High School also obviously has a great deal of interest in today's space launch. Judy Fortin is there. Well, Odetta, Concord High School officials are playing it safe today. Until they get the word the launch is on at 1138, they're going to keep students in classes. Good morning, Krista. Hope we go today. Good morning, Krista, too. Again, the launch faced delays, primarily because of cold weather, a factor that would in part ultimately determine the shuttle's fate. Well, today we're just going to send up the balloons. We thought that would look nice and maybe she can even see them. And we hope to put the banner that's now in the cafeteria outside so okay. everyone can see it. What does the banner say? It says, we're with you, Krista. We just hit the T-minus nine mark just now. And a moment ago, NASA control said the status as, as of the moment is a go. So everything looks very, very good. When Krista comes back, you planning a big party too? We were talking about having a... Um, big welcome home party and maybe a dance and we were hoping to show some slides of what's been going on while she's gone. The flight of the Challenger lasted 73 seconds. The images will last forever. It is just stunned silence here. We do not know exactly exactly what happened. It looked like a fire, an explosion. It is very hard to tell. Krista McAuliffe, the first pure civilian, the first teacher in space, with her parents and lots of children in attendance from her school at Cape Canaveral today. Twenty-four space missions had already been accomplished before a tragedy occurred on this one. I had hope for them and I thought it was just the shuttle was in one piece in the, in the water. I really didn't uh, think that they would be all, they'd be dead. Some people were covering their eyes and, and some people were just watching the TV set with a blank look on their face. In an instant, Krista McAuliffe was gone. For America, it was a national tragedy. But for New Hampshire, it was far more personal. She was a part of us. She was part of a family. And just like if your sister or brother died, she's, she'll be remembered. I don't think there's any question that she... Uh infected us all with her enthusiasm and 
In addition to a loss to the family, it's a loss to the state and a loss to the nation. Oh, she's so nice. She's just a real caring, kind person. She just, she's like a, well, she's kind of like a big sister to me, kind of. I, I just, I, she's just really special. It's hard. Krista McCullough fearlessly chased her dream, but dreams come at a price, and that price is often high. A presidential report revealed that the explosion was probably caused by a faulty pressure seal and that cold weather played a role in that failure. The death of all seven crew members viewed by millions of people highlighted the inherent danger of space exploration. And it was that danger that Krista stared in the eye and brushed aside with a smile. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Krista, you have touched the face of God, and I ask you to ask him to be kind to me and to all of us. Krista McAuliffe was an extraordinary woman in an ordinary kind of ways. Ordinary, but extraordinary. It may have been what made Concord High School teacher Krista McAuliffe so special to so many people. For Bob Holler, spending time following Krista McAuliffe was his assignment. Over the seven months leading up to the launch of Space Shuttle Challenger, the Concord Monitor columnist realized Krista was much more. A friend, a role model, a woman teaching students and adults about life. She was, had this sort of infectious uh, personality, very upbeat, positive, great charisma in a kind of ordinary way. You know, you, just, you met her and you sort of connected with her. You felt like she knew you. Holer flew to Houston in July of 1985 as Krista McAuliffe went through training and testing with nine other teachers, all of them hoping to be the one chosen for a seat on board the upcoming Challenger mission. July 19th was decision day. I was with her the moment that she was chosen uh, to, to be the teacher in space and rode with her from the, right, the White House to NASA. And the newspaper man was there as the local rising star became a national sensation. She was a teacher at heart, but she became so popular and, and so big in New Hampshire that there was, all, there was talk of her maybe running for the Senate. But her passion was with her students. On leave from work and training with NASA, a friend and colleague remembers Krista insisted she be allowed to return to Concord to attend the first day of school. So she came back and she talked to the faculty at the first day and we gave her a gift. And the gift was one of those globes that stood up on its own stand. And when they presented it to her, they brought it out on the stage in the auditorium and presented it to her. And they, they told her, this, Krista, is to just to make sure that you find your way back here. A major malfunction. Everybody got really silent. So I remember it was kind of a somber time. Because of the New Hampshire connection, um, you know, the loss just seemed to be that much more. It wasn't a distant uh, loss. It was a very local loss. Seeing their family, looking up and wondering what was going on, the doubt and all that. Just, uh, you, you'll never, you'll never, never forget it. Countless granite staters hold on to vivid memories from that day 25 years ago. Bob Holer was with the crowd in Florida and admits Challenger and Krista McAuliffe changed his life. The loss of Krista taught me a lot. I never knew that I could achieve some of the things I've achieved since then. You know, when she said reach for the stars, when she said may your future be limited only by your dreams, you know, I took that to heart. People all across the country took it to heart too and shared the indescribable sorrow of a family in Concord, the school community, and an entire state. Anne, who spent seven months in Krista McAuliffe's shadow, thinks that in her life and death, she taught us all about dreams and determination. She was one of us. She was, you know, she was going to space for all of us. Uh, in this country, you know, she was she was the ordinary citizen. And so her legacy lives on, not only in Concord and my family, and but families across the country. So today is the 30th anniversary of the explosion. Fifth grade teacher Kristen Jakes can give this history lesson from personal experience as her students study a biography of Krista McAuliffe. Krista herself 
I mean, just as a person, left a mark on people. And on her. Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, was her social studies teacher at Concord, New Hampshire High School. She remembers the excitement watching Challenger launch with fellow students, the confusion, then tragedy. In that time, we were not watching launches and we didn't know, you know, what to expect. And, and then there was hope that there were parachuters coming out. The idea uh, was to get the program re-energized. McAuliffe shared her training and the experience left its mark. Now Kristen Jakes has followed in her teacher's footsteps. She just reached everybody. She respected every student and she brought the best out of everyone. When McAuliffe was a finalist for the NASA program, she told me in an interview about the enthusiasm for teaching she hoped to generate with lessons from space. I think I've always been a risk taker. I, I like to do things that are, are adventuresome. I'm really hoping that it generates a lot more excitement in the education process and, and gives teachers a, a more positive role. We would have kids in the back of the class who had no did not want to be there and she she got them participating she brought the best out of them and I thought that's a real talent to be able to do and a model she has adopted for herself when they posed it was like a portrait of America men and women war veterans and first-time astronauts parents and even a classical pianist their commander was Francis Scobie age 46 from Washington State an astronaut after 22 years in the Air Force this was his second shuttle mission Second in command, pilot Michael Smith, age 40, a decorated Navy pilot from North Carolina. Like Scobie, he'd seen combat in Vietnam and trained as a test pilot. And like the commander, he was a husband and father. This was Smith's first shuttle mission. Mission specialist Ellison Onizuka was the first Hawaiian astronaut who believed in the benefits of the space program. There are a lot of uh, outcomes from these projects which will affect both our society and the rest of the world. Onizuka is survived by his wife and two daughters. 36-year-old mission specialist Judy Resnick was a shuttle veteran, her assignment to operate the shuttle's mechanical arm. She was on board the shuttle Discovery in 1984 when a launch was aborted after the engines had fired. Gregory Jarvis was on board to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness on liquids carried in tanks. Born in Detroit, trained as an Air Force satellite engineer, Jarvis was on his first shuttle mission. Ronald McNair, age 36 from South Carolina, brought a background in physics and laser technology to the shuttle program. This was the second trip to space for a husband and father who saw space travel as a calling for mankind. I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore. These six, along with Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, now a tragic page in NASA history. Ginelli opened the sealed vault for the first time two years ago to pick just one object. When you saw that piece, what did you think? <sighs> My heart fluttered. We saw a little piece of red. The red of the flag. The red of the flag. And then dusting that off, you could just see the flag come more into view. Um, and then we knew we had it. This was the piece. The exhibit also features the largest collection of personal objects from the two crews, loaned by 11 of the 14 families. A Star Trek lunchbox, a Cub Scout uniform, young adventurers who would become legends. Um, so it's important to get that sense um, of the magnitude of the sacrifice and the loss. Um, so we redouble our efforts never to have this happen again. But not all of NASA's scars are on display. The space agency decided not to show the now iconic images of the disasters in flight. Instead, videos show the recovery efforts and some of the handwritten letters from children. One wrote, I know being an astronaut is dangerous, but they were brave enough to follow their dreams. It's the power of those letters that still moves June Scobie Rogers. We had rooms full of letters. Her husband, Dick Scobie, was the Challenger commander. One of their two children, Kathy, picked the items for her dad's display case at the exhibit. She chose things that were memorable to her. And the helmet, I mean, she remembers time sitting around our dining room table where he would put on that goofy helmet that made us all laugh. But to see their individual remembrances is a nice reminder and honor for them and the way they lived. Since the exhibit opened quietly in June, some visitors have come to touch, others to teach. Many mourn what might have been. They didn't come home, and uh, I, I don't ever want to have to go through that again. Why not leave 
the past buried. Some would say this o opens a wound all over again. I don't think it opens a wound. Uh, you know, it's our history. It says who we are as a nation, uh, that we don't let adversity stop us.